Today on the final bar, we will wrap the week. We'll look at the five days that have just taken place, look at the trading patterns, and connect the short term to the long term. Nice, strong finish to the week. Triple Witching Day finishing to the upside. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a rainy and smoke free Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets. Using the power of technical analysis, the technical toolkit is helping us identify patterns and focus on how investors make decisions and how those decisions are reflected in stock prices. I mentioned how it has been super smoky. We've had wildfires all in this area of the uh, of the country. It's made the uh, air pretty unbreathable. Today we have rain. I can't believe as Seattleites we were cheering for rain, but we were, and we finally got it today. So while the rain finally comes and dissipates the smoke, talk about a bull market move to end the week with the major averages up over 2%. We'll look at all the charts here in a few moments when we get to our wrap the week segment. I did want to let you know about the upcoming schedule, by the way. Had a couple really good uh, um, interviews this week. Hema Reddy focusing on some GAN patterns. Um, uh, Jeff Huge with some really good uh, long-term Elliott wave counts yesterday. A lot, a lot of fun. So make sure you check those out. Next week on Tuesday, the 25th, Bruce Frazier, educator and White Coffeean joining us on the show. On Wednesday, the 26th, Mish Schneider of Market Cage. And then on Thursday, the 27th, Jesse Felder, editor of the Felder Report. I want to continue on to our Wrap the Week segment. Well, let's start with a poll. We always have a poll going on our live stream page at stockcharts.com, and we also put them on our social media accounts. So give us a follow on Twitter. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We asked you recently which ETF performs best over the next three months. Clean Energy, which is ICLN, the FANG stocks, FNGS, oil and gas, XOP, or gold, GDX. Oil and gas, by far the strongest winner 70% of you said that's the right play. Based on what's happened this week, it's hard for me to disagree with that. Um, when you think about the next three months, that would take us through mid-January, which takes us through the election season, through the beginning of the new year. When you think about some of those macro headwinds and tailwinds, I mean, there is a scenario where you get loyal, lower oil prices, but it certainly doesn't seem to be heading in that direction, right? You get oil prices improving and you get energy stocks really doing well with SLB, the biggest gainer in the S&P 500 today, up over uh, over 10%. It's interesting, though, I always am interested in looking at the uh, at the things that didn't get a lot of votes to see if there's a contrarian play to it. Clean energy, it's interesting. Look at the relative strength. You really want to be interesting uh, or, or look at an interesting chart. Look at the XOP relative to the ICLN. That is the um, basically old energy versus new energy or you know uh, fossil fuels versus clean energy. And again, despite what you think politically or where you think the long-term trend is heading, the reality is that there's such a, a reliance on crude oil and there's a limited amount of it and the price is going up, which means oil and gas companies probably going to do pretty well. I'm intrigued by gold, by the way. GDX not getting a lot of uh, love and the price of gold not doing particularly well, uh, which makes me think that there could be an opportunity there at some point. Again, that that is you know assuming the fact that the dollar stops going up because it's hard for gold to do incredibly well when the dollar index keeps going continuously up and to the right. So if that would happen, uh, then potentially we get room for gold to uh, perform a little bit better. Thanks for answering that poll, by the way, and thinking about some of those different ETFs and what may be coming next. Let's wrap the week by going to our wrap the week chart. So this is a chart we review every Friday. And what we're going to do is look at this chart. We'll talk a little bit about what happened today. And then we'll go to the Mindful Investor Live chart list, which is some of the big picture measures of price, breadth, and sentiment. Here's how the week actually played out. Uh, the S&P with a decent week. Uh, today's move, pushing it for the week, almost up 5%. It was around 4.7%, which is one of the better weeks we've seen, certainly in 2022, in quite some time, right? That's actually a, a banner week among uh, among certain weeks where we've been uh, struggling mightily. The Nasdaq actually outperformed the S&P this week up 5.6%. 
Below that, everything else underperformed the S&P. And from the top, we have small cap stocks up 3.6%, emerging markets up 3.2%. Gold actually had a fairly strong week for gold, <laughs> up 0.8%. Still not anywhere near stocks, but at least it was not going down. In brown, we have crude oil prices up 0.6%. Blue is Bitcoin, which is actually relatively muted. It's funny, with all of the movement that you saw in risk assets and stocks and bonds, cryptocurrency is kind of chopping around in no man's land, not really validating upside or downside for uh, for stocks, arguably. So Bitcoin finished the week up 0.3%. The dollar index was down 1.2%. That's using the UUP. And that going down is what allowed all these other lines to go up for the week, right? So the weaker dollar is giving the space for risk assets to do better. The worst performer of the week were bond prices down 5.5%. So we have this long-term configuration, I would argue, of a stronger dollar, weaker bonds, weaker stocks, higher interest rates. And that's kind of been the story of much of 2022, certainly what's been happening since the August high in the S&P 500. The question I would be asking if I'm an investor, which I am, is do I assume that that pattern is going to continue or is there some reasoning why I think that pattern would change? If that pattern changes, in, in meaning weaker dollar, lower rates, higher bond prices, higher stocks, um, you know, that would be a very different look than we've seen in 2022. There is a certainly a possibility of that. And I would say going into the seasonally strongest part of the year, November and December, that's a pretty optimal time when that could happen. However, I will be excited when I see the evidence support that. And that's not what I've seen necessarily yet. Nice bounce today for stocks. So let's talk about what happened uh, today. The S&P up 2.4% to 3750, just above there. And a nice move through the course today, nice move out of the open, uh, continuation going into the close. This is a very unusual day, a very non-2022 type of day, uh, but certainly showing some strength through the course of the uh, of the session. Mid-caps and small caps both up over 2%, and the VIX actually down a bit, back below 30, which is uh, could be pretty important going into next week, right? When you think about what's happened recently, it's been a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, and a lot of instability and the VIX above 30 is one of the basic ways to measure that uncertainty or measure that instability. VIX below 30 starts to look more like the recovery phases in 2022. So if you're optimistic about a nice bullish run going into next week, I would hope that the VIX remains below 30, which is why that might be an important chart to uh, to watch. Interest rates actually jumped higher out of the open. The 10-year yield briefly went above 430 for the first time since over a decade, we're going back to like 2008, if I remember right. I'm, I'm trying to think of the chart in my head because I don't want to get away from this too much. But uh, 10 year yields, you know, really close to long term highs, but came off through the course of the day. Bonds actually, uh, you know, did OK going into the uh, into the close and uh, 10 year yield around 420 long end of the uh, of the curve, continuing to go a little bit higher with the 10 year yield above uh, 430. Dollar index, as I mentioned, weakening today. And that was certainly one of the, the reason or maybe the reason why equities could look so strong. Gold and silver having a nice day today as well, along with uh, with some of the commodity complex. Some of these were down a little bit like natural gas prices, uh, but overall energy stocks did just fine. Um, materials actually had the best out of the 11 sectors, as we'll talk about in a moment. Cryptocurrencies, another choppy day among many. Bitcoin was actually down to 18,700, but reversed back to the upside. And as equities were appreciating through the course of their trading session, Bitcoin got above 19,000, currently above 19,200. Ether prices, Back above 1300. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a key level to pay attention to. As we've mentioned a number of times, cryptocurrency is starting to improve a little bit. That's encouraging. Um, however, what you'll notice is the trend in cryptocurrencies arguably has not changed a lot. When I look at the chart of Bitcoin, I see a big round number of 20,000. That's sort of the mental line in the sand that I have for it. <clears throat> Bitcoin gets above 20,000, then that's something to pay attention to. Until it does that, this trend is not really, um, um, I guess, um, meaningful enough to the upside to justify getting too excited about the prospects for cryptocurrencies. On a sector basis, materials up three and a half percent. That was a big win for a sector that's been uh, that's been kind of off a lot of people's radar, I would say. But if you look, some of the biggest gainers today in that sector, including FCX, which is a uh, mining stock, mainly copper, and then Nucor, NUE, which is a steel company, both having a nice move to uh, to the upside today. Both up eight and 10% respectively. Let us look at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's so funny. Um, it's not funny. The, the smoke has been so bad here. I feel like all of uh, 
uh, the Pacific Northwest is going through some sort of issue with breathing because it's been so thick. The good news is the rain has come and it's clearing the air. So we just need to uh, recover here. Looking at the uh, Mindful Investor Life chart list, we're going to start <clears throat> with the uh, market trend model. This is an important one. Market trend model actually switching to bullish in the short term. My market trend model has three uh, parts to it. The long term, the medium term, and the short term. The short term, think of it as a couple days to a couple weeks, maybe. The medium term, a couple weeks to a couple months. And then the long term, anything way beyond that, right? A year plus. So far, though, my long term model has been negative for most of 2022. My medium term model actually has been negative since early September. And the short term model just turned positive today. Models until Friday at the close. So uh, I try not to pay too much attention to them uh, during the week. But if you look, the short term model has been bearish since mid August. We just actually turned back bullish today. What that tells me is that there's been enough of a rally off of the lows. It tells you their short-term strength. This tells me to, at the very least, uh, you know, uh, anticipate that there could be a further appreciation. We could be setting up for another one of these, but I would still label it as a bear market rally, similar to what we saw in June, similar to what we saw in May, similar to what we saw in March. Why would I keep calling this a bear market rally? Because the medium-term and long-term model remaining bearish tells me overall there hasn't been enough recovery yet to declare a change in trend, right? The, the the primary trend, the main trend that I'm trying to understand has been positive for most, most of 2020 and most and all of 2021 and turned negative early in 2022. And I think that's where we remain as we continue to make lower highs and lower lows. Having said that, let's look at the daily chart of the S&P and see what actually happened. So this week was really about movement to the upside and not just you know, like a gap to the upside and that was it, but actually chopping around and finishing at the strongest point uh, this uh, this week, right? So this was Monday back here. Friday, we had that weird day, which was Thursday of last week, big move to the upside, that bullish engulfing pattern. Friday gave about half of that back. Uh, and then we have Monday of this week sort of pushing to the upper end of that range. The rest of this week continue to push higher. So We've made a, uh, you know, we've we've continued to push to the upside. We're now above 3,700. My first question for this market, can we regain this level right here, which is 3,800, 3,820? That's for a number of reasons, right? That was the swing high in early October. That's why that's an important one uh, just in, in, in terms of per, pure price analysis. But also it's a key Fibonacci level, right? That's a 38.2% retracement of March 2020 up to January 2022. That's why we've been talking about it for so for so long. We remain below there. This is sort of a just brief move to the upside before the next leg down, which certainly could happen. My conversations with Jeff Huge opened my brain yesterday to some of the uh, downside potential. But we get above 38.15, 38.20. I have to start looking at some other targets. If and when we would do that next week, you'll hear me start talking about some upside potential and where to look for future resistance. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back powering up your use of the Stock Charts platform. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements before we continue on today's episode. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's episode, and we would love to feature one of your questions Tuesday of next week when we will next open the mailbag. Our email is the final bar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air Tuesday of next week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. Three fantastic guests this week. Dana Lyons on Tuesday. Um, Jeff Huge yesterday. Hema Reddy on Wednesday. All really interesting charts that made me think a little bit. All of those previous interviews and a lot of great special content are available at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. To search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's continue on our show today with Power Up. This is our 
weekly attempt to upgrade our use of the Stock Charts platform. There's so much uh, in terms of features and, and capabilities of our platform, and I just try a little bit every week to point out some really cool ideas. By the way, if you like this sort of thing, uh, my friend Grayson Rose does a great show every Friday called uh, Stock Charts in Focus, where he gets to spend a lot more time playing around with the Stock Charts platform. What I wanted to do is show you on your dashboard. <clears throat> so as a member, you have the, the uh, Stock Charts dashboard, which basically is a customizable window to help you see where the markets are at and really help you think about where you want to go next, right? This is a starting point. It's a launch pad to your analytical process, I would hope. If you scroll down a little bit, you're going to find your chart lists, right? And I have a bunch of other things on here, which uh, in future episodes we might go to. But I want to talk to you briefly about chart lists. Before I use the Stock Charts platform, I didn't realize how much of the platform is driven by chart lists. And this was an early design decision by Chip Anderson, our founder, who is a former Microsoft engineer and created this uh, website from scratch, essentially. He went with the idea of chart lists, which was once you chart things, you're going to, want to group them in a meaningful way. And we don't have watch lists. We don't have monitors where you're putting tickers in there. We have chart lists. And your chart lists work in a lot of those same ways. You can use it as a watch list, use it as a monitor of price action, but it also gives you a way to focus on the charts themselves, which is really core to what we're trying to do at Stock Charts. I wanna to talk to you just briefly about how to organize your chart list because when I was just getting started, I immediately had an unwieldy number of chart lists because every time I run a scan, I do this every week for my uh, premium members at Market Misbehavior, I run a scan called New Swing Highs 13 Week and all of a sudden I have a bunch of those. Anytime I do, a research project or a special episode on Stock Charts TV, I create chart lists to help me capture the charts that I want, you know, related to that story that I'm trying to tell. But you'll notice that I have certain chart uh, lists at the, uh, or certain chart lists at the top of my list because I'm using a simple organizational system. If you use numbers and symbols, you can immediately put the most important chart list at the top of your list. This is something Grayson Rose and Art Hill and Greg Schnell and Tom Boley all have helped me uh, understand in my formative years as a stock charts user. Uh, years ago, I sort of followed their lead and they really, uh, I think their guidance has been really, really helpful. Grayson uh, Rose always does a great job of pointing out use symbols at the top. So this chart list, which is what I use, if I ever wanna post something on social media, I'll save a chart, a ch chart to this list and then I'll post it on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And so that's the main list that I'm hitting randomly during the day. So that, I have the exclamation point, so it's right at the top there. The Mindful Investor Live Chart List, which I share with all of you, is right there at the top too. After that, it's numerical in order, in descending order. You can see if you think about the digits you can use, you can put this in whatever order you want. I would encourage you, as you have more and more chart lists, as you use the Stock Charts platform, use symbols and numbers to put the most important ones at the top. Then anytime you're looking at your chart list, anytime you're looking at a particular chart, you can click there and you get the most important chart list right at the top of your list. So that is the way to keep your chart list uh, well organized. And that is our segment, Power Up. Let's continue on our show today with the next segment, the final bar mailbag. The mailbag is always open, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Let's get to question number one. Dave, why did you choose September 2020 as the low for your Fibonacci retracements? And I believe the chart you're referring to, I actually added to the Mindful Investor Live chart list because I've been referring to it pretty regularly. I think it's this one here. <clears throat> and uh, the question was, why did you use this as the starting point for Fibonacci retracements? And earlier in the year, we talked a lot more about some of these levels, right? And uh, ignore the pink one, just focus on these green ones kind of here. If you look at the September 2020 low to the January 2021 high, 38.2% of the way down was 4,200. Halfway would be 4,000, 4010, we'll call it. 61.8% is 3820. Those are the key levels we talked about. And then obviously a full retracement would go down to 3,200. When I talk about the likelihood for the S&P to go further down and I'm asked for my downside target, I've been saying 3,200. And the reason is because of, in no small way, because of this chart. Uh, what I just mentioned would be a complete retracement back to September, 2020. It would also be a 61.8% retracement all the way down to the March, 2020 low. So there's sort of this confluence of support right around 3,200. I think that ends up being the eventual low and whether that happens this year or next year, I don't know. I don't know the timing of it, but I, I do know that based on this analysis, that seems the most likely downside scenario, in my opinion. Your question was, why did I pick this level? Mainly because it was a significant level, right? When I was looking and the market started to sell off, I really saw this in January. 
when the S&P was making a new high, but a lot of individual names and a lot of breadth and momentum indicators were not. The question was, well, where might we, might we correct to? So what I always do is look left on the chart and find meaningful levels. So of course, I went with March 2020, the most obvious level kind of sticking out from everything else. But the problem is the first level there was 3,800, which is quite a bit uh, further down, right? That was a pretty big haircut, 20% drop. So I wanted some levels between there. So I looked for the most significant low between March 2020 and the peak. And I came up with September uh, 2020. That was sort of a three-month consolidation period, the first real major consolidation after the March 2020 low. And that's why I picked it. Fibonacci retracements can be uh, you know, systematic in a lot of ways if you, if you uh, approach them that way. Uh, however, I think the most important question you need to ask is what are the levels you use? So I think a lot about which levels to pay attention to. It's never on, on accident. And, and a lot of the, what I would say, um, maybe amateurish is a, is, a, is a mean thing to say, but I would say um, people that I think use Fibonacci retracements incorrectly are not spending enough time focusing on the importance of the levels that define the highs and the lows. So that's how I would answer that question. Next one, I ran across the Titanic indicator, but can't find any information on it any insights and uh this right here is the chart that uh you sent and it's using this uh this indicator which may be really hard for you to follow but it's this exclamation point a bunch of letters um so thanks for that question and thanks for uh you know sending me into a rabbit hole of sorts going through uh breath data so i have to credit a couple of people on this one for the assist carl swenlin who is our resident uh breadth indicator expert who is an active contributor to stock charts i first uh, thought of him and he pointed me to resources by Tom McClellan. Tom McClellan has an article on his website talking about the Titanic indicator, same article that talks about uh, the Hindenburg Omen, so I would check that out. And also Greg Morris, who wrote the book on breadth indicators. Carl reminded me of that. I dug out my copy of that and was able to get, look up some uh, information on it. So long story short, it is very similar in uh, in concept to, um, to the Hindenburg Omen, right? And if you think of the Hindenburg and the Titanic, you can see why these things are, are named as these horrible accidents because it's a sign after a big bull market phase that conditions might be a little rough. Now, the Hindenburg Omen has like three or four different pieces you're looking for. The Titanic indicator is very, um, is very simplistic. It's basically looking for um, the number of 52-week new lows or new 52-week lows to be greater than the number of new uh, 52 week highs within seven days of a market top. So as the market's making a new high, either within seven days prior to the high or seven days after the high, you have new lows outnumber new highs, which mean the market's making or has made a new high, but all of a sudden there are way more stocks making new lows than new highs. And that often indicates the beginning of something dire happening. If you look back on your chart, you can see you have a, a Titanic uh, syndrome indicator uh, there in November of 1919, you had a cluster of them in 2021, which arguably did not work particularly well. But you had this one that was pretty good uh, at the top there at the uh, at the end of last year, beginning of uh, beginning of this year. Similar to the Hindenburg Omen, you'll find have some random false positives, but when this pops up on your chart, I think it's important to uh, pay attention to it. One note, by the way, I love the chart that you sent, and thanks for sharing that with me. What I would tell you though is that you can actually do this trick and say position behind price. So you can actually overlay the indicator and then uh, you were looking at the NASDAQ or the NYSE composite. And if you do that and mess around with the colors, you can do some really cool things to just kind of visually, you know, line up the two of these and see overlaid on the price series when some of these conditions happen. That's just a tip on using uh, stock charts. Any of these binary indicators kind of uh, meant for you to overlay it right onto the price action. So thanks for that question. Thanks, Carl, Tom, and Greg for your insights on the Titanic indicator. I learned a little uh, from your question. Next question, I really like having a squeeze indicator on my charts. Is there anything similar to TTM squeeze on the stock charts platform? And thanks for sharing a chart uh, from another platform uh, where you show that TTM squeeze indicator. We actually do have that indicator uh, on stock charts, and it's part of stock charts ACP. So let me go here. Stock Charts ACP is our advanced uh, charting platform. It is a fantastic toolkit. Um, always on my list is to use it more. We are finishing and finalizing the Stock Charts TV studio, which we uh, which we uh, shared with you for the first time as part of ChartCon 2022. Part of that will be using ACP live on the shows a little more often than we've been able to do uh, remotely. But if you look to the little plug-in uh, signal on the uh, on the lower uh, right corner. You'll see a series of plugins. One of them is called the Advanced Indicator Pack. And as long as you install that Advanced Indicator Pack, 
which is a free plugin uh, from Stock Charts. One of those indicators is the TTM squeeze. This comes from um, boy John Carter, who's at Simpler Trading. He created that indicator years ago. We feature that as part of our uh, part of our plugin. We do have some premium plugins from Simpler Trading, particularly uh, TG Watkins Moxie indicator, and hopefully more to come. Uh, but that is a free plugin. You are welcome to use it. Uh, just install the advanced indicator pack uh, that we provide as part of Stock Charts ACP. Um, that is it. Boy, this uh, questions go so quickly. I want to thank you guys so much, as always, for bringing them in. Keep them coming and send us an email with your additional questions. But we have to wrap the show. Let's go to the three and three. Three charts in three minutes. And here we go. Uh, hold on. I missed it. Here we, here we go for real. All right. Chart number one is the uh, market trend models. I mentioned I didn't get the uh, the, the label updated yet. Uh, but short term, we did turn to a bullish signal here. And I wanted to highlight that for all of you. I, you. I created my market trend model to help me have a systematic way of thinking of the market on three different time frames and just have something running in the background to help me recognize and acknowledge the trend on multiple time frames. This is a foundational piece of the premium um, market misbehavior membership that I offer. We go through uh, the market trend model and along with other things every week to talk about changes and uh, what that should mean for positioning and thinking about uh, macro, uh, the macro environment and uh, for risk assets. But uh, just briefly for our purposes today, that turning back to positive tells me to still consider this a bear market rally, but accept the fact that we've rallied enough to the point that I have to put serious consideration to the, to the idea of a counter trend move uh, moving above the current levels that we've seen and think about some short term objectives to the upside to pay attention to. And I would encourage you to do that. Chart number two is the uh, daily chart of the S&P 500, keeping it pretty simple here for the three and three today. But I want to share with you a trend line. I was just looking at this chart earlier today uh, for uh, for an interview, and I just connected the high in January, the high in March. Lines up very well with the high in August, as long as you're using a, a log scale chart, which I would always recommend. And that gives you a potential upside objective. So now that the short term market trend model is positive, the question is, what's a potential upside objective? And there are levels we talked about, like 3,800, which I think could be important. The 50-day moving average is around 3,890. I'm looking at that as a you know really sort of stretch goal to the upside. I think we could go all the way up to that level, which is around 4,150 or so, depending on how quickly it takes to get up there. Still be within, I would argue, a fairly clearly defined bear market phase, but have a lot of room for the upside. I'm thinking about what names, things like energy, could be semiconductors, could be um, Netflix breaking above uh, resistance this week. There are a lot of names that could be a part of that recovery story, but it tells me to think about upside potential there. Chart number three, Huntington Bank Shares, HBAN. Shout out to Columbus, Ohio, which is the headquarters of Huntington Bank Shares and Go Bucks tomorrow against the Iowa Hawkeyes. That is not the reason why I selected uh, Huntington Bank Shares, though. I selected it because the chart was starting to look compelling. If you look, HBAN bottomed out in June. Tested that low a number of times around 1150 and then reverted to the upside. Hit the 200 day moving average, stalled out a little bit. While other things, including the S&P, came way down to retest the lows after the August peak, Huntington Banks has kind of hung in there, along with a lot of other, a lot of other financial stocks as well. We've been in sort of a sideways range, right? Between 1270, we'll call it on the lower end, maybe 14 and a quarter on the upper end. As of today, we've made a new multi-month uh, swing high. We'll call it a new six-month high uh, and uh, and and uh, potentially breaking out of this range to the upside. Decent up move, and this is an earnings name this uh, this week. A number of the regional banks reported, a number of them had a nice bounce. Uh, and I like the fact that we rallied out of the June low. We consolidated. Now we're potentially resolving to the upside. Seeing some strengths, not just in uh, HBAN, but other regional banks as well, certainly seems to be a change of character from a distribution phase the first half of this year to more of a consolidation phase, and now potentially the beginning of an accumulation phase. I've looked to see if it can hold that breakout level. HB HBAN above 1450 next week, pretty compelling chart potentially. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. All of our previous interviews and some great special events are at StockChartsTV.com. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.